Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on ichthyosis vulgaris. So in this lesson, we're gonna talk about what this condition is. We're also gonna talk about some of the signs and symptoms, ways we can diagnose it, and how we can treat it. So ichthyosis vulgaris is an inherited skin condition involving abnormal keratinization. So the skin can look something like this. We'll talk about more about this in more detail in the next upcoming slide. But what I want you to take away from this is that it is inherited, so it runs in families and it involves abnormal keratinization. So really that means that the skin as it is forming, the skin cells as they're forming the layers of skin doesn't quite form the way it should. So with regards to the inheritance component, we call it semi-dominant inheritance. So sometimes you might see it is more prominent in some individuals than others. And it is an autosomal dominant trait, but it doesn't act completely like an autosomal dominant condition. It is caused by mutations in the filaggrin gene, so FLG, and this encodes for the protein prophylaggrin. So prophylaggrin makes up part of the skin layer. It really makes up the granular layer, the stratum granulosum. So here is a brief diagram of the different layers of skin. So stratum corneum is the upper layer, and the second layer is the stratum lucidum. And the stratum lucidum is only found in certain areas of the body, like the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. The third layer would be the stratum granulosum. This is where ichthyosis vulgaris affects. So prophylaggrin makes up this area, makes up the granular area, the stratum granulosum. So what we find in ichthyosis vulgaris, because there is an issue with the formation of prophylaggrin, we see a reduction or even absence of this stratum granulosum layer or the granular layer. The other layers, stratum spinosum and stratum basale, are present. Now, the epidemiology of ichthyosis vulgaris involves an early onset. So it generally occurs early on in life. It starts usually in infancy or early childhood. It's actually a relatively common condition. Some of the estimates for individuals that are affected by this condition range from anywhere in 1 in 80 people to 1 in 250. So it can be more than 1% of the general population has this condition. And it is associated with atopic dermatitis or eczema. So we'll find that when we look at these conditions, atopic dermatitis and ichthyosis vulgaris, they have similarities, but they also have important differences. We're going to talk about that in the next slide as well. So what are some of the clinical features of ichthyosis vulgaris? So the important thing to note about this condition is there is a spectrum of clinical features. Can it be anywhere from simply dry skin, so it looks like dry skin, it can actually be mistaken for dry skin, all the way to that scaly, diffuse pattern. So that's really key to this condition. There is diffuse, dry, and scaly skin. So again, because there's a spectrum of symptoms or signs, we don't always see this pattern in everybody. Some people have very mild symptoms. Some people have a very severe clinical presentation. So for the most part, when I talk about this, I'm going to talk about the more clinically apparent condition. So diffuse, dry, and scaly skin. So we can see here, if we look up close, there's a very diffuse, dry, and scaly look to the skin. And we've seen this image before, so we can see this kind of scaly appearance to it. And the scaly appearance can be anywhere from white to gray scales. And where this condition affects is important to recognize. The affected areas in ichthyosis vulgaris include the trunk, so the abdomen and the chest, and the extensor surfaces of extremities, so your arms and legs. But what we don't find is that the intertriginous areas, so areas like the armpits and the groin where skin meets skin, so that's what intertriginous areas are, these areas are not likely to be affected in this condition. We can also see palmar hyperlinearity. So what does that mean? So if you actually look at your hand, the normal lines in the hand, there's actually more lines on a person's hand that has ichthyosis vulgaris. So that is what palmar hyperlinearity is, more lines on the hands. This is not very specific to this condition. We can see this in atopic dermatitis or eczema. But what we do find is that the thenar eminence, so the thenar eminence is here, this kind of fleshy part of the thumb. If there's way more lines here, if it's very hyperlinear, 
in the thenar eminence. This is more likely to be more specific to ichthyosis vulgaris. We can also see keratosis polaris. So this is what keratosis polaris looks like here. And again, this is not specific to ichthyosis vulgaris either. We can see this in atopic dermatitis as well. What we do find with this condition is that there is a seasonal variation in symptoms. What we find is that the symptoms of dry and scaly skin improve with warm and humid weather, but worsen with cold and dry weather. So what I want you to take away from this slide is that there is a spectrum of clinical features, anywhere from very, very mild, dry looking skin to this pattern we see here where it's very diffuse, dry, and scaly. Again, the trunk and the extensor surfaces of extremities are the affected areas and intertriginous areas are not likely to be affected. And we can also see palmar hyperlinearity and keratosis polaris in this condition, but we can also see that with atopic dermatitis as well. So how do we make the diagnosis and how do we treat this condition? So the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis. We look at the history, we look at the physical examination, and we make the diagnosis that way. It also helps to get a family history. Because this is an inherited genetic condition, we find that it runs in families. So you oftentimes see a parent also having similar signs and symptoms as the patient. So it's important to get a good family history. You can also do a skin biopsy and do a hematoxylin and eosin stain or H&E stain. What we'll find under that stain is that there's an absence or reduction of the epidermal granular layer, like the stratum granulosum. You can also do genetic testing, looking at that filaggrin gene, but that is not likely to be done. How do we treat this condition? So the treatment of this condition is often very supportive. There's not really no medications that you give these patients. We can use frequent bathing. So Taking frequent warm baths can help help reduce and help remove some of that scaling dry skin. Warm temperatures. We talked about this before. Because of that seasonal variation, warm humid conditions often help with the dry scaly skin. We can also use emollients in moisturizers. So moisturizers, usually that are glycerin-based compounds that help keep that moisture in. And we can also use keratolytics that contain urea and or salicylic acid. These have been shown to help with that dry, scaly skin as well. And interestingly, with this condition, we find that symptoms may improve as the patient ages. So as the patient gets older, symptoms of this condition seem to get better. So I just wanted to add that on there. It's not a treatment, but it is an important point to note that some of the symptoms can improve with increasing age. So again, in review, ichthyosis vulgaris is a clinical diagnosis. You could do a skin biopsy and do an H&E stain and see a reduction or absence of the stratum granulosum. And then with treatment, oftentimes it's frequent baths, emollients and moisturizers that are usually glycerin-based compounds and or you could use keratolytics that contain urea and or salicylic acid. So that was a lesson on ichthyosis vulgaris. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.